All right. Uh, we're ready to begin then. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, happening now is an exhibition held in conjunction with Anachronometrics, which is the final installment of the Symposium on Architecture that is um, organized by Iñaki Abalos, professor in residence of architecture here at the GSD. Um, this semester, the symposium asks architects to share how they are encountering the past and the future in their work today. Uh, Anachronometrics is a neologism that the symposium's organizers and the curators of this exhibition, myself and Chantal Blakely, have coined for the condition of being displaced in time, of seizing hold of the future or the past as a point of comparison. So in order to begin this conversation, the exhibition exposes a collection of objects from the special collections here at the Loeb Library, here in the reliquary, and then there are objects that are too fragile to be taken out of the special collections projected on the wall here. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the library staff, especially Inez Salduendo, for all their help in making this possible. It really wouldn't have been possible without their enthusiasm and their support. So it would be customary now for a curator to explain what the objects are, what, why they've been selected, or what their significance as a collection might be. But precisely that's what we're about to hear from our panel of current and soon to be graduated students. The objects presented here are a set of mute forms for the moment, presented in their indeterminacy, an indeterminacy of their content and significance that's made explicit by having no labels and no explanatory text about what they are. Looking over the exhibition, one could say that the condition it manifests is characterized by an abundance of evidence, a lack of a narrative thread that would cohere those disparate objects, and an encounter which occurs in the moment of uncertainty. So the exhibition has the form of a question or an enigma. So today, we are hearing a first set of encounter with these artifacts in the beginning of the symposium conversation, a glimpse at what some anachronometric stances might be today. So to do this, we are, we are joined by students who I'll introduce now just briefly. Kao Barbazoa, who's an MR2 graduating in 2016. Alexander Porter, who's an MR1, who graduated in 2018. Sofia Blanco Santos, who's an MR2, who will be graduating in 2016. Ellie Keller, an MDES, who graduated here in 2016, and is currently uh, pursuing a PhD in HCC at MIT. Sarah Arafain, an MR2, who is going to be graduating here in 2017, and Anthony Mori, an MDES student here, who's also graduating in 2017. So I'll leave it at that and invite Cao to begin. Please join me in welcoming. Thank you, Colin, and thank you, Chantel, for uh, inviting us to be a part of this anachronometrics uh, conversation. And thank you, everyone else, for being part of this uh, discussion today. Um, for as long as arbitrariness exists, you and I will still have a place in architecture. It is a consequence of an impulse which in return derives from an instinct, a gut feeling, and a pool of precedence. The objects displayed here are not a precise selection filtered and debated over long hours of curation and theorization of curatorial purposes. Neither are they the remains of the few items that can be brought out and exposed to daylight from underneath us. The objects displayed here are, among other things, an arbitrary personal collection of their own interests and even cliches. A collection of a personal historical account upon which we are to build once again. 
That is to say that the act and choice of the items are composed with a degree of arbitrariness and its intelligence is discovered post-rationally through debates, discussions, and most of all comparisons among the past and what lies ahead in the future. Arbitrariness rises, of course, when a decision needs to be made. Here, the decision of calling them all history and claiming they, they all live under this pretension is to, on the one hand, presuppose that we have been afforded with enough time and distance to create space for action, and on the other, single them out from their histories and contexts. But what if we haven't yet? What if we have not had enough time yet to distance ourselves from, from it? What if it's still too early to tell whether or not they all belong to history? An arbitrary history, nevertheless, defines a single approach and attitude towards architecture, questioning architectures and history's role today. What is not architecture? What is irrelevant for architecture? And what has not made history? And what are their own histories of history? Architecture in itself presupposes an affirmative future. Architects do the same by instrumentalizing the principles adopted in architecture into foreseeable futures. Our tools and resources at hand today have not changed those tenses, but rather brought them closer to my point of view. As we continue to live in the present, past and, past and future seem to be walking towards each other. Or you may see it as if present time is expanding largely into the past as it is in, into the future. If we believe in the latter argument, that is to say, we also believe in the importance of history, theref the time, therefore history. If for a moment we believe, we look to the past to understand the future, one might argue the future is to a degree predictable and the arbitrary is to a large extent removed from history itself. The less history determines what, what we have to be in the future, the greater is our freedom of being and becoming, and therefore the greater is also our fear to cope with the arbitrary. Let us believe that the unpredictability or serendipity upon which discoveries in architecture rest be told through arbitrariness. Let the alternative modes of history from the past and present unfold in whichever arbitrary way as they would so that utopia can once again become a tool where it is no longer just an image of our predictions, but can equally inform the present and even the past. I do not equate all, all past with history when discussing architecture in the same way that I wouldn't claim that what lies ahead is already historical material to be unfolded. At some point, a decision an arbitrary one will be made and history will fall in place. What is certain though, is that history will always be there potent and charged. To be arbitrary is to perpetually include alternative histories and to continuously speculate and stay critical about the presupposed truth of history. We have proved that between the design techniques offered by our faculty and students, the means and methods through which we either organize and design and how we render and represent space as demonstrated in interior matters, we have proven that this project has indeed not finished. It is the zeitgeist of our time. One evidence is the disappearance of the clean cut render. Now the collages apart from all of this are meant to also make you pull from the past and use it traditionally and historically. And so perhaps that is why they, choose, they chose the topic for this symposium, because among all that is solid, all that is beyond the present remains. With this in mind, I also propose that we, instead of calling this anachronometrics, we think of it as prochronometrics, meaning a chronological error in which this historical event has been assigned a different date than the actual one, still TBD. Thank you. Closely, you might still be able to hear it. The needle oscillates with precision, riding the grooves that pass like so many mechanical waves, washing ashore over figures drawn in the sand. Fixed on an axis, the cylinder spins swiftly in place, the low pitched rumble of its rotary motor ever reminding us of the technological artifice. The needle floats steadily above the cylinder as the voice rises in the nasal, warbling whine of speech, and the scratchy likeness of the storyteller leaks into the room. From the, the story being told is the operation of the graphophone, the Volta Company's late 19th century model based on Edison's phonograph or speaking machine from 1878. In the exhibit, it's happening now, now. 
you'll find that the box containing this machine is closed, and that my description is in fact necessary to interpret what you are seeing. Its tale is over before it has begun, an end before a beginning, which requires this fiction to sustain your interest. Indeed, it is fiction I present, for unless the audience is well-versed in the subtle history of late 19th century recording devices, the contents of the box are completely uncertain. The only certainty, it would seem, is that the box has something to do with history. That Strange the issue, issue of space, of space and, time. and time. The unique operation of a distance, however near it, it may be. be. This we know for certain. The box's physical materials look old. It is protected, and therefore important. Its protection is transparent, so we are invited to look at it. It has a handle, but we are not invited to handle it. If this unmarked box makes a case for history, it is for history's death, its obsolescence, its fine. The box is useless like a case of bow ties we have forgotten how to tie. It is a device to play sound, but used as such, it becomes kitsch. As an object of study, it is academic. As far as the graphophone is concerned, it has lost its claim to novelty in a present that is focused on what is it's happening, happening now. now. And what is happening, happening now? This year, Moss principals Hillary Sample and Michael Meredith frame this problem as an imperative to, to remember, remember that, that we are, we are in, in a moment after, after architecture. In which a architectural avant-garde must establish its own desires to exist after the previous opportunistic practice of a digital, digital rococo. Rococo. But remains to ask of our discipline when such strong suspicions attack forms of reference and novelty alike. Moss does not claim this argument to be happening, happening now. Rather, it belongs to a tradition of declarations that the final act of history is now upon us. For instance, Eisenman saw architecture that operated as writing to mean the, the end, end of, of the, the end, end as much as the, the end, end of, the beginning, of the beginning, an end to the telos of goals and the mythos of origins. The past preceded a futureless, futureless present, present, beholden only to a timeless space of invention. The difficulty with this conclusion, as Moss's provocation points out, is that every piece of writing, like the wax cylinder revolving on the graphophone, will invariably come to an end. In a 1936 essay called The Storyteller, Walter Benjamin distinguishes storytelling from writing on the basis of the novel's it's essential it's dependence on the book. book. For Benjamin, the written novel is symptomatic of the withering of deep experience because it, it has, has removed narrative, narrative from the realm of living speech, speech and at the same time is making it possible to find a new find beauty, a new what, beauty is in what is vanishing. Just as the graphophone supplanted the voice's claim to speech and meaning, so too does history's anesthetization happening, happening now, now assume the primacy of death in order to represent history to its audience. For Benjamin, this is the crucial limitation of the novel and of writing, that the reader never finds life in a novel, but only the, the meaning, meaning of, life, of life, repeatedly producing its death as she closes the book. By contrast, a story never ends, but concludes always in the provocation, the moral of the allowing story. Benjamin to claim writing as the terrain of death and storytelling as that of life. There is no story for, for which the question, question how does it, does it continue, continue would, not be would not be legitimate. The novelist, on the other hand, cannot hope to take the smallest step beyond the limit, limit at which, at he, which writes he writes finis, leaving us in a perennial epilogue. And so it is at the close of the book that we reach our beginning. If we seek vitality, we might find it in the rhetoric surrounding Le Corbusier's 1958 Brussels Pavilion, as described in the pages of Poème Electronique. What got them so excited? Why aren't we this excited In the foreword, Jean Petit introduces the project, saying, The discovery at our fingertips, the man, the man invents, man. Sometimes, sometimes without worrying about the consequences, about the consequences it produced, while their, while their modes, modes of expression in perpetual evolution depend more and more on, on technique. The emphasis on the body, its appendages and tremors, is met by the immediacy and certainty of technology. Le Corbusier adds, answering to all places the new instruments had entered into or opened the door of imagination. The electronic light prolongs the day, creating new hours of activity. The gramophone recorded sound, speech and music, the photograph had entered the dwelling. 
everything is mechanical, new and vital. Le Corbusier is careful to invoke the senses, the vitality of ceaseless activity under artificial light, and the new social structures centered on the entertainment of recording technology. But how did the architecture sustain this story? Design technique for the pavilion came from the well-known involvement of the Greek engineer Yanis Zenakis, who used ruled surfaces to delineate the form described by Le Corbusier's plan as a series of stomachs. These techniques, described through words, images, drawings, and calculus in the preceding 150 pages, end in Zenakis' statement, we will say for conclusion that a new conceptual consciousness, abstraction, and infrastructure technique, the electronic, is today transforming human civilization. Did this Precisely. technique relate to the story being told? What's the state? Certainly, Zanakis's formal and construction techniques sort of paralleled sensory media novelties in the pavilion, but how do we use them to arrive at a story about newness as such? While hyper-rationality seemed new at the time, the concept of rational technique is very old. In Book 6 of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle distinguishes between techne and episteme among the forms of apprehension and knowledge. Episteme concerns an object of scientific knowledge, while techne refers to the characteristic or trained ability of rationally producing it. Where episteme is cast as the sweet fruits of well-studied pedantry, techne is a mode of production whose results do not contain fact, but the likeness of fact, rationality. Aristotle goes on to say that artistic works are those with the, the characteristic, characteristic of producing, producing under, the, under guidance the guidance of true, of true reason. reason. Unlike episteme, which stockpiles <laughs> truths <laughs> as they are discovered, techne is only the characteristic of rationality. Indeed, that same characteristic of rationality, of the production of something new, imbues the poem electronique with a certain novelty of which Xenakis's formal techniques are the vessel. Using Aristotle's logic, Xenakis claims the pavilion's novelty as a discursive fiction, fiction, fiction a fiction that is made plausible by his commitment to the characteristic of rationality, developed through his technique. Techne supports this fiction. It is its medium of expression, the set of rules by which the statements of discourse lay claim. The techniques themselves are real in the same way that fictions are real. But fictions are not always novels. We want fictions, not news. Fictions employ technique. News delivers fact. Sorted fictions clutter our bookshelves. Rotting newspapers litter our waste bins. Fictive technique emerges when architecture can outlive its own novelty. It jumps past the present to become the future as the past. Intentionally confused. Said a different way, fiction is the quality I use to describe the object as it becomes history. This is why the value of techne as storytelling must exceed the rational information it sequesters. As Benjamin contends, the value of information does not survive, survive the moment, moment in which it was moved. It, was it lives only in that moment. It has to surrender to it completely and explain itself to it without losing any time. Techne allows us to escape from novelty's clutches as we hasten to explain ourselves. It keeps the story alive beyond the moment of... So I guess I have to give you a kind of, kind of line, um, which I would say has to do with remembering technique and kind of um, understanding that using technique to support our discursive fictions is also a way of supporting, oh, I don't need more technology, a way of supporting who we are uh, as, much, as much as what we are doing and that the show reminds us that the importance of technique is, uh, like Walter Gropius's bow tie, so easily undone.
Well, hello everyone. Thanks for for coming. Uh, I'm actually not gonna comment in on one of the objects we have here. I'm going to address one of the quotes that's on the wall back there, and that reads, "Let's have some new cliches." So I thought that uh, this was interesting because new cliches, in a way, is as much anachronometric as it is incongruous and contradictory in itself. Cliché is a French word for the sound a stamping press makes in a process of making multiple identical images. In other words, something has become cliché if it is ordinary, expected, overused, and in a way lacks original thought. The cliché, by its very nature of being commonplace image or expression, is not in and of itself establishing new epistemic grounds. The cliché does not initiate paradigm shifts. Rather, it verifies that one belongs to an existing paradigm, an operating discourse. When about 100 years ago there was a cry that ornament had become crime, what was truly being mourned was the loss of cultural value and of inherent cu culture that ornament had had in previous times and which now had become widespread, repetitive, mechanically used, cliché. Today, similar claims can be made with regards to climate, construction, or form. We could even go as far as to say that architecture has also uh, made these claims. But in a way, cliches are ready-made. They are put out there without much anxiety for authorship. And there is also a knowledge that is inherent to the cliché. Cliché seems to carry a sense of truth, an obvious truth, and one that is shared and enjoyed by many. They seem to allude to something that is universal, not personal, that functions socially, not only physically, but also culturally. So when Samuel Goldwyn, someone who was particularly known for his complexities and contradictions, called for having some new cliches, he was urging an attempt of making the ordinary, the boring, the familiar, unfamiliar, and giving it a sudden twist of renewed interest. These new cliches also call for an understanding of architecture as a productive review of our world, society, objects, and buildings into something new and unforeseen, but at the same time strangely familiar. Some of the most important architectural texts of this century departed from a critical revision of history in favor of a cliche-filled countercultural pop culture, which even today proves valid. They did so by looking retroactively at the cliches of cities and of the everyday life in them, questioning the necessity of making unique and special buildings and understanding that perhaps other motors such as capitalization were even more inventive than architects themselves. This allowed what at first seemed to be simple cliches to truly become archetypes of certain kinds of lifestyle in the metropolis. So at a time when the archetype seems to have become the cliché, when architecture has as much as the ornament had 100 years ago lost its cultural meaning, where more than ever architecture has just itself as a model, it might be time to look back at the everyday cliches and to review architecture through them. In a way, to review is to look at the past with the eyes of the present. It is to see from a distance, as if for the first time. True ideas are atemporal, so the cliches surrounding them will just constantly reinvent and renew themselves. Similarly to this discourse, this exhibition presents, presents itself as the cliché white modernist box, a boîte à miracle, an abstract box in which we are left to wonder the functions of its interior or even some of its content. Some of the objects presented here in front of us stand as true revisions of some of the most important clichés of architectural history and of architects themselves. The monumental pyramids are turned into huge solar collectors. The tape measurer is readapted to once for all fit the scale of the human body, the use of geometry, the seriality of the bow ties. The true decontextualization of these objects, devoided from their temporal and geographical background that propel them, invites us once again to their rereading, seeking to create with them new cliches. Thank you. Yeah, I want to thank Colin and Chantel for inviting me back. It's nice to be here. Um, and I'm going to use the box. Um, so what I would like to talk about um, is names and a tower, unnamed. In this unnamed box, 
there is an object unnamed, which represent an unnamed project on a site unnamed, commemorating those whose names have been taken. A book of unnamed histories, of architectural tracings unnamed, that are nothing but figments of a past effaced and unnamed. Not diagrams, but ghosts, as their creator named them, whose provenance has been taken away, bringing them all into our present, unnamed. I do not remember being given a name, too young, too loud, too long ago. But, and all of you in this room are probably like me, except for these objects, we're giving a name. One that stuck, one that we carry with pride or with shame, one that has given us by virtue of our parents, our ancestors, the initiators of our own histories, a place in time. Now, and as long as we live, our names will be a point of reference. So let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we make ourselves a name. Make a name for ourselves. But how does one give oneself a name? How does one create for oneself a history? We are all given names, and we carry them wherever we go, present ourselves, leave our traces. But the questions of names, of name given, giving and name taking is a question of history, of history making and history erasing. And it is, it is a question of making of place. So make a name for ourselves. These objects have names, no? They must, they must do. What are they? I'm certain that some of you know. I know that we do because we've been told. They're too important to be left without a name, without a history, without a way to be called into place. But, and by the virtue of a curatorial decision and the people named on the wall, these names, their names, the names given to them have been taken away, erased. Erasures imply former existences. Their place, though, has not been taken away. Rather, devoid of their names given, history disappears. All objects are brought into our present, allowing us, histories in the making and makers of history, to invent each of them, for each of them an artificial past, to fabricate a construction of time, to designate places. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. In this book, right there, whose name has been taken away, there are structures, ghosts, apparitions, victims. Each structure has been named. It says so on the first page. Each structure has been named, given a history, a past of possessions, events, occurrences, a name. Standing for those whose names have been taken, these structures fill up a place holding names, a monument built over a ruin in which names and places have been meticulously written down and then eliminated. Now these structures are marked by a line in a book. The lead of an architect's pencil disappears and the question of giving names is brought up through the nameless. Structures unnamed. Site unnamed. Project unnamed. Architect unnamed. I too unnamed. The first three are easy. We practice them day in and day out. But is it possible through ar architecture to give oneself a name? Or will every attempt end up in a tower with its head in the sky? Is it possible to designate our own history without quotation, to look forward without looking back? Quotation. This is John Haydock speaking. We all look back. This looking back is a sin. I'm quoting a man named. I love history. I like to read books. I like the past and everything else. But it has very little to offer when you're cutting a path through a freaking jungle. Maybe it shows you how to sharpen your knife, but that's it. What if we name not pasts unnamed, but futures now named, and then turn ourselves into name givers, named and placemakers, named, makers of futures, unnamed? So come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth, but not Babel. Thank you. OK. Um, my uh, presentation is called Architecture Will Eat Itself, and um, it's 
going to be on the topic of irony and nostalgia um, in the role that history plays, uh, plays in architectural production. Um, so I first want to start by briefly considering uh, the Ouroboros as a model of understanding history and creative production. Um, the symbol that you see on the slide is um, an ancient symbol called the Ouroboros, uh, which represents the concept of eternal return. Um, it's uh, related to an idea that the universe and all of existence has been reoccurring and will continue to reoccur in a self-similar form in an infinite um, uh, number of times across time and space. Um, so this repetition of history, the acceleratingly circular nature whereby each moment negates the one before it, trying to be the new now, the next now, and to make whatever used to be now look like then, um, is viewed sort of negatively as a self-consuming um, aspect of the role of history and architecture. Um, on the other hand, uh, one way to view the Ouroboros is that all cultural production and the role of history in um, creativity is self-begetting, that um, there is this kind of self-sufficiency of nature and a self-fecundation, um, that life feeds off of itself, that it begets itself, it weds itself, it impregnates itself, it slays itself, and that history is the prima materia of art. Um, so, uh, in a similar way, one can see two emotional styles that have um, characterized attitudes towards history um, in architecture. On the one hand, there's nostalgia, which views history um, in a longing way, as in a, with a kind of sentimentality as something to be returned to. And on the other hand, um, there is irony, which um, treats its historical references with um, a slight disdain um, and even a sense of mockery. Um, and I'm going to argue that both of these attitudes towards history are um, a kind of emotional coping mechanism and um, that often they are like in a dialectic to each other. Um, I'm going to start by defining my terms. Um, the concept of irony uh, originated with Aristotle, um, who said that Socrates was the, um, typified the attitude of irony um, as a kind of acceptable form of dishonesty. Um, he also, um, in Nicomachean Ethics, he talked about a series of virtues by which you have to um, establish correct behavior. And um, this correct behavior and acting appropriately in a situation is sort of the initial concept of coolness. Um, so one, considers, in modern times, we consider someone who acts the right way at the right time or says just the witty um, witty saying at the right moment as someone who typifies coolness. Um, then the concept is evolved in Sprezzatura in uh, Renaissance Italy um, by Baldassare. Um, and you can see this concept. Uh, Sorry. Control zero? Yeah. Full screen now. OK. Um, so then in Spezzatura, there is um, there's a concept of uh, uh, studied effortlessness, um, which again, you can see in these two photos, uh, the one on the on the left is by Raphael, which shows they're, they're paintings of the exact same thing. They're the, the marriage of the Virgin. On the left, you see Joseph um, very formally elegant. And on the right, you see Joseph sort of careless, ironic, um, showing a kind of um, emotional distance and ironic detachment towards um, the event. Um, and. Um, so I guess I just want to end on the topic of ir irony and coolness um, by saying that, in a way, it's an emotional um, coping mechanism that typifies cultural resistance. Um, and on the, other, on the other end of the spectrum, you have nostalgia, which is um, historically been viewed as a kind of pathology. In medieval times, it was thought um, of as fatal, in a way, or pejorative. Um, and you can see those attitudes of irony and nostalgia going back and forth in a dialectic through all of these tropes. 
Um, less is more, less is bore, I'm a whore, more is more, yes is more, less is enough. Um, and so I'm going to just take a stab, hopefully this will prompt some discussion, um, but I'm going to take a stab at looking at pointing out the evolution from, of nostalgia towards history, towards irony in history. Um, so the primitive hut would be nostalgic, um, classical antiquity would be nostalgic, medieval architecture would be nostalgic towards pagan architecture um, and the, the artwork of barbarians, um, Palladio would be nostalgic towards uh, classical architecture, um, arts and crafts is again nostalgic towards medieval architecture. Um, modernism starts to show a little bit more irony, but it's nostalgic again towards classical architecture. Um, again, this starts to be more bridging the line between nostalgic and ironic um, in terms of how it treats its historical material. And then we have fully ironic. And I would say that since postmodernism, it's been fully ironic. Um, Super Studio ironic. Bjark Ingels um, explicitly ironic. Um, and I'm just going to end by saying that probably the best architecture is architecture that um, is able to achieve a both and condition um, of being both ironic and nostalgic. That's it. So the conference or symposium is called Happening Now, and I have no idea what that implied when they told me. Um, it was a provocation given, and yet it, it seemed to be explicitly contradictory. How could you possibly know what's happening now, right? When a moment becomes a happen, it's no longer now, and when a now cannot possibly have happened because a happen already implies that it's being recognized as happening. So the contingent factor in this whole conference is that there's an I, there's a me, there's somebody to witness the happening or the now to exist. So happening now, a single phrase implies that the past, as it, as it, is, as it is seen through the usage of happening, the current with the existence of the I, and the future with the connotation of some sort of a projective now. It's this awkward triangle of past, I, and future and this somehow seems to bring up the implication of the ghost of history amongst everyone. So the now, it's happened. And never has history been so much all around us, we can't escape it. Never has history been so popular. Every corner we look around, history is waiting patiently. It's as if history has taken over, there's nothing but history, everything is history. Is, is the new now then history? Are we living in histories now? Does history dictate our now? Is everything only history? Or are we just characters in history story or is it the storyteller that we're just living in? And yet this conference, this symposium, this provocation is a conversation of history. But what we have before us are just objects, quintessential objects, neckties, notebooks, and sketches. If my memory serves me right, when Colin and Chantel approached me, they said this was a conference on history, of pondering history, a conversation of our time and place within it, a conversation of Mortality, desire, knowledge, creativity, and rules. So what did I miss? It appears that what we have in front of us is history. It appears to be a collection of objects isolated in a box, covered in plastic, with the aura of history emanating from every corner. At least that's what they told me to believe when they told me about it. When we go to a museum, we discover history. And yet again, it's presented as objects on top of podiums or in a case promptly declared as an artifact of history. We stand before them and feel history around us somehow exuding from the cold marble or frigid air, meant to keep history safe, preserve it, keep it alive. But yet, maybe it should just die. When we go to a library, we see history standing face to face, spine to spine, layers upon layers of history, stitched in leather and cardboard, all preserved in brisk, crisp, again, cold air, solidified on metal racks, intended to keep history at arm's length at any moment. But what happens when the museum is nighttime, when the library is in nighttime? What happens to this box of items when the library closes? Is it nothing more than a privileged, obsessive, compulsive hoarding disorder, solidified by a really, really cold atmosphere? Is it just a series of items saved from the garbage disposal called time, forever destined to the beckoning demands of theorization and historicity of humanity? Are these history? Because I don't see it. Where's the history? Where's the current? Where's the eye? History, by definition, means to see, and yet I have no idea what to see or what I didn't see. 
What did I miss? Or did I see it and not know it was history? Why didn't someone tell me that I was seeing history? But also history means to know. Do I know history? I don't know if I don't know history. How would I know that I don't know that I should know that I wouldn't know history? History is also a narrative, and yet I am not sure who its characters even are. Did I miss it then? Did I blink? Is it gone? And if so, we stand here looking at objects. What do we see? We see books, names, dates, more books, more dates, more names, all stored in a box. Is that all history needs to persevere through time? A date, a name, and a box? Why does this collection of objects become equatable to history? When did seeing become comparable to keeping and preserving? Do we see history? Are we told what history we are to see by its name, by its date, by its label? Do we know what to see in history? Is history destined to be captured in a labeled box? Is history destined to exist in special collections? In rooms with controlled air conditioning on shelves that, there will, that no one will ever see? For it to be history, I mean, it has to be seen. To be ordered alphabetically, chronologically, haphazardly, just awaiting a scholar vying for tenure to rescue it from obscurity? Does it rescue then again, does this rescue again destine it to be solidified in just one more text, numbered and recorded and lost from sight all over again, removed from our own narrative? When did the aesthetic of history shift from reality to the archival? Has history shifted from a moment, from a way of discovering, from seeing, from reality, to seeing itself, to the aesthetic of objects? To make case point of fact, we have a box of archives. And that's history. Everyone just cringed. Um, history does not exist in a box, in an archive, in a space preserved to be forgotten and remembered by a Dewey decimal system. It is not called upon by a number. History is not organized by librarians, historians, or theorists at that point. History is not a collection of artifacts. It is a series of beginnings and ends, ends and middles, middles and endings, and at moments it's made up of moments that never even happened. Happening now is a way for us to think of what history is now. Not yesterday, not the day before, not the day after, but to see history as it is and what we want it to be. To decide what to do with it and maybe it's just time to throw it all away. It's a way for us to remove every single box from history, tear it open, tear open every single archive, every quote, every footnote, every name. History now is only now. It vies to be removed from boxes, from text, from the academic insecurity of obscurity and the chains of insular scholarly investigations. It vies to come back into time, into the now. History is not an aura or a dictation or a text full of pages. It is more incomplete image than more, it is more of an incomplete image with more voids than solids. It is ripe for creative manipulation, construction, re-imaging completely. It is open to the eye and useless without it. Wipe this table clean, remove the dust. Happening now is a way for us to massage history, to feel it squeeze, flow, and expand, and push through our hands as we grab it, to knead it into the form we wish. Happening now does just that. It allows us to bring everything to now, to see. To see now mixed with the old, with the new, and the future with no consequence and complete freedom. And really, who the hell are we scared of? Who are we hiding from? Who are we all afraid to see us? What do we have to lose? History? Trust me, it's not watching. In fact, it's waiting for us. No matter what we do, it will be there, waiting to be seen, waiting to dilute every single moment, and ready to represent eternity with an object in a box, in a museum, in an archive. Push it further. Destroy the box and stand out in the open. Raise your hands, destroy aura, destroy the cold, destroy the sanctity, make it your own. Exist. History is not made by standing in a room and reading it, by stacking boxes upon labeled boxes. There is no single narrative, no single timeline, no single name, no single date, no single text, no single book, no single box, no single author, no single character. Not one single sentence and not one single moment. It is made up from everything, from every moment, destroyed in the next, and remade before the dust settles. It is made by seeing, touching, and being. It's made now. Did you see it? If not, it's fine. Just pick a new one and start from fresh. Thank you. <laughs>